You know, Robin and I were camping earlier this year. We were in a state park. We were walking our dog that was on a leash because we're weird Oregon people, so we keep our dog on a leash. There was a dog that was off leash. They must be from Idaho. And... <laughs> And uh, we're coming through this park, and this dog was over at their camping spot about a couple hundred yards away and spotted us. And he is just making a beeline straight at us, just coming. Everything he could get, he wanted to close the gap to get to where our dog was at. And he got about halfway there. He got about halfway where we're at, and he makes a 90-degree turn at full speed, just like that, 90 degree. And we looked at him and see what was going on. He chased a squirrel up a tree. So... <laughs> And Robin, in particular, we were both cracking up laughing about this because we laugh about it all the time. But she's always saying, she's always saying to me, just the one word, squirrel. <laughs> because it's like, how come you didn't get such and such done? Or did you finish this? And she'll look out, you know, it's like bedtime and all the shed doors are open and my truck doors open and there's tools scattered everywhere. Squirrel got distracted, didn't finish what you were doing. And we, we want to talk about in this passage today, that there was a distraction that kept some people from from seeing and following Jesus. Now you'll see in our outline that we've got printed here, there are two columns and it's a contrast. And it really is what we find in the text in John chapter 3 beginning with verse 22 that is contrasting John the Baptist and what was going on with him and his people and Jesus, what was going on with him and his followers. And the contrast, a lot of the contrast is between John the Baptist himself and Jesus. And remember, the main thing that John is presenting here is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He said at the end of uh, John that his purpose, the reason that he collected the stories that he told was to demonstrate that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Son of God. So, that is the main thing that he's doing in this passage, and it comes through clearly here. Now, one of the things we had mentioned before in talking about John the Baptist is that when John wrote his gospel, there were still people around who were followers of John the Baptist, and they got scattered throughout the Mediterranean region. We know this because as the missionaries went out to spread the gospel, to teach people about Jesus, they would run into followers of John. They would run into people who were baptized by John the Baptist. And they didn't their training was not complete as it were, you know. They they uh they went off and got distracted and they needed to, you know, return to the Dagobah system and see Yoda on that little Oh, now where was I? I got distracted. Saw a squirrel. Um so their training had not been complete. They didn't follow through their training. They knew only the baptism of repentance from John the Baptist. One of the purposes that John has here, no doubt, is to say, what's the distinction here? You know, in our culture, you'll run into people, especially in university, you'll run into people who are allegedly followers of Muhammad. You know, they could be followers of Buddha, Confucius. Okay, there's any number of of different people that can be listed, and a lot of times what happens is people are just like, oh yeah, Jesus was just one of many. You know, he's the guy you follow, and here's the guy that I follow, and they're all pretty much the same, and the main thing is that you're sincere. No. That is not at all the scriptural concept. And Jesus is not even in the same category, which is the main point that John the Baptist, or that John the writer is making in this Uh, additional story about John the Baptist. Now I call it a cross-examination of John the Baptist because John the Baptist has already been on on the witness stand. We saw that earlier in the book. And now he's returning to him again. There's some questions asked of John and John reiterates his testimony. John's testimony stays the same. The movement is Jesus and his disciples, verse 22, went into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now we know... If you're reading ahead from John chapter 4, verse 2, that Jesus was not the actual one who was baptizing. Remember this, if you look at the text here, it says, Jesus and his disciples went into the countryside and they baptized. In John chapter 4, verse 2, it says, it wasn't Jesus who was doing the baptizing, it was his disciples who were doing the baptizing. Okay, that's just a clarification that John makes a little later, and I'm going to insert it right here. John was in a different location. He was baptizing at this Anon Salim. 
because there was plenty of water. That's a very practical thing, right? If you've ever done a baptism, we, we did them all the time in Eugene in the Willamette River. It was always kind of a trick in that part of the river to find a place that was deep enough. Okay, if you're baptizing several people and the water's maybe you're shallow enough, if you lay them down, you can get them actually underwater. But then as the preacher, you got to get them back up and standing up. All right. So the deeper the water is, the better. That makes a lot easier job of it. It's just a practical matter. There was plenty of water there. Also, he makes this note that this was before John was put in prison. So it assumes that we have this information about John being arrested. And where do you find that? In Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As I mentioned before, John has Matthew, Mark, and Luke as a source book, and and uh, he has this information, uh, assumes that his readers know that John was eventually in prison. And of course, this took place before John was in prison. The writer, John says, An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John, John the Baptist that is, and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one who who you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. These are the guys that I'm going to refer to that are distracted. And they're distracted by a number of different things. They don't get the main point of John's ministry, what John was teaching and preaching. In this transition period where he was slowing down, but he had at this point already introduced the Messiah, and he was continuing, because he had this gathering, continuing to point people to to Jesus. Verse 25, some of John's disciples. Where were the best of John's disciples? Where were those guys at? The ones who were really paying attention to John's teaching. Where were they at in this story? <laughs> exactly. They were with Jesus. They're the guys now who used to be John's disciples, and now they're disciples of Jesus. So they're the ones who are baptizing with where Jesus is at in the Judean countryside. That's exactly right. The ones who really got what John was teaching and preaching were following Jesus. That was his whole thing. And this is an important thing. It's going to be the main takeaway for us today is the importance of not getting distracted by all the trappings. These guys were enamored with being with John and the whole thing that went with it. Maybe the people who came, they were excited about the crowds that were there, but they weren't really paying attention to what John the Baptist was teaching and preaching because if they did, they would be following Jesus. Uh, John the Baptist himself reiterated, and it's not the first time that he said this, I am not the Messiah. When he was questioned before, he said, I'm not the Messiah, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the prophet. And then he goes on to say, I'm not worthy to even uh, untie the sandals of the Messiah. Okay, that was earlier. Now he's saying, I am not the Messiah. On our chart, you'll see across from that, Jesus, under the column of Jesus, he is the Messiah. Okay, that's implied, it's not stated there, but, but that's exactly what John the Baptist means. He gives a story about being a friend of the bridegroom versus Jesus, who was actually the bridegroom. The point of that story that Rex read earlier is that the, the friend of the bridegroom is not the main focus. He's not the main guy. He's just there helping out. The focus is to be on the bridegroom himself at the wedding. When it comes to the guys, everybody knows where the real focus is in. Focus is, it's on the bride, right? But his point here, for illustration purposes, is the friend of the bridegroom is not the bridegroom. The main guy here, the main guy is the bridegroom. It's the groom, as we call the groom. Okay, he's the main, the main guy. So that's why John has this contrast here. And then John says of himself, I must become less. And he says of Jesus, he must become greater. He doesn't mean that Jesus himself can become greater. He's talking about the emphasis that's placed on him, that people need to understand who Jesus is. And as they do, they'll understand that he himself is the truly great one. And that's in verse 30. Now, John gives kind of a a little longer explanation here, talking about, in this contrast, the difference between the two of them. In verse 31, he's describing Jesus, and he says, The one who comes from above is above all. 
Okay? Jesus, who comes from above, who comes from heaven, is above all. In contrast, is John the Baptist, the one who is from the earth, belongs to the earth, and speaks as one from the earth. So see, I have that. John the Baptist, in the, on the left column, he's from the earth. Jesus is from, a he, from heaven. And it also lists in there, because of that, he's above all. John the Baptist speaks as one from the earth. Jesus speaks the very words of God. That's a huge contrast. We need to make sure that we keep this straight. We don't run into people who are just straight up followers of John the Baptist anymore, right? That's not really an issue. At this time, that was something that would that's something that was true. And people would say, Oh, people were following, there was a lot of people following somebody who was a Jew from Palestine. Was it John or was it Jesus? They kind of put him on the same the same level because they didn't know any better. But John himself, his testimony, his own testimony, said that um, Jesus was the one who was the greater. It was the whole purpose of his ministry all along. Now he says of Jesus also, verse 34, uh, For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. So we have love by the Father. It's true that John the Baptist was also loved by the Father as well, by the way. But he he puts this in connection to his position because he's his only son. Jesus is the Son of God. That's the point of John's Gospel, right? Has everything placed in his hands by the Father. That's Jesus referring to him. He's the object of saving faith and the giver of life. We already read that earlier. Um, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. John 3.36, by the way, that would be a great memory verse. Moms and dads, you want to add another memory verse for the kiddos? That is a really good one right there. Okay, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So he's the object of saving faith. He's the one in whom we put our faith. Now, that's a huge, huge difference. And it's interesting because the Scripture describes in a lot of different ways that we need to have faith in Christ. The most important thing is not the amount of faith that we can have. We can have faith like a mustard seed. It can be a very small amount of faith. The important thing is the object of our faith. The one in whom we place our faith. Okay? I like the illustration because when I was a kid, I used to be around creeks all the time. There was a a year-round trout stream that was um, literally from where I'm standing to where Larry is sitting back there. Okay, That's how far this trout stream was from my front porch. And anytime you decide, man, we're going to have, let's have some, what are we going to eat for dinner? Okay, let's have some trout. You just grab a pole that was on the, on the porch, kick over a rock that's out there, grab a worm off of it, and there's about four or five little places that the trout always hid out in, you know, that were along there. You didn't waste your time on where the water was just running straight and shallow and open, whatever, because they were in these little sheltered areas. And you could go out there and catch the... So so my brothers and I, it was right in our the yard we played in all the time. It was a creek running through, year-round creek. We were always in trouble about that creek. Always in trouble about it. You know, we were... We would... We, you know, would fall in frequently. When, when my kids were little, Tim, who was Mr. Scientist, our youngest, he was always squatted down looking for stuff in the creek. And he's looking at the bullheads in there, and he'd see the trout go by. And, and both of the boys would get out a fishing pole. This is at the house I grew up in. And Tim, eventually, no matter where we camped, and if we were Grandma and Grandpa's house, he would fall in. I mean, you just knew that was a given. In fact, Robin just eventually started just putting whatever he was wearing, just expecting him to fall in the creek. And he always did. So uh, my brothers and I were always in trouble with this. And, and there were we were around a lot of sloughs. It was in some of the uh, upper parts of the tidewater areas and stuff. And we were always crossing these crossing creeks and stuff constantly. We, we grew up where it was very wet. And so one of my favorite stories about how, we, how, much, uh, how to place faith in something is this idea of a plank across a stream. We would be the ones who would, 
you know, grab a two by six or something and just lay it across the creek and to get to the other side of it, right? And sometimes we were good at choosing whatever it was that we were going to cross the creek with, and sometimes not so much. And it depends, the older you got and the bigger you got, the more careful you had to be about what you thought you were going to cross the stream on. And you could have a ton of confidence in a weak plank. You know, you put a two by six and have a big knot in the middle, or you just it couldn't hold you anymore. You know, and you would just have a tremendous amount of faith in that and walk out, and the thing puts you in the water. Okay, but then we had some stronger creek crossings where we'd have some kids come out, and we're trying to tell them. No worries. Watch. I'll walk across it. It's not going to break. It'll hold you up. And they would be, with fear and trepidation, you know, kind of inch out there a little bit at a time and get across. They didn't have much faith, but the important thing was how sturdy the thing was they were placing their faith in. You understand what I'm saying? And there are a lot of people who say, it doesn't matter what you believe in as long as you really believe in it. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It really is. Because the important thing is the object of our faith, what we put our faith in. Now, John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, were distracted. They were distracted by the trappings of everything that had been going around, and they didn't even listen. You know, they were they considered themselves to be adamant followers of John the Baptist, but they really weren't. Like Rick said earlier, the ones who were paying attention, they were already over following Jesus. John's disciples, they didn't want to give it up. They didn't want to think about, here's the main thing that we're trying to accomplish here. It's sort of like when you're raising kids and you're getting to the point where they're, you know, to get out on your own. A lot of the things you've been doing about teaching them responsibility and about following through their chores, you know, table manners and all the things it's going to take for them to be successful in business and everything going forward, it all has a focus and it's moving in a, in a direction where they become viable, where they're supposed to be gaining these skills and living on their own. That transition doesn't happen a lot of times as smoothly as it should as well. It's the same type of thing here. And so these guys weren't making this transition. I've been thinking about lately quite a bit about what we, the sort of things that we do at church that can get us distracted from the main thing. As Christians, we are to be followers of Jesus. There's a number of ways that people can get distracted. We see this described in the scriptures in different ways that they're fall. You know, they may be uh, a big fan of John MacArthur or Chuck Swindoll or you know any number of people that they say that they're following and to the degree that those guys who are they have some things to teach those guys are pointing them to Jesus that's all cool but if they get distracted and off base on what they're what they're to be doing then they've missed the whole point we can get that way about church sometimes too the time of day that we meet the fact that we have a building at all is not a requirement. You guys know this, right? This building that we're in is not the church. The church is the body of Christ. It's the believers. It's those who are born again believers. So we could all meet it, you know, up at the place where Dwight's living right now. That's they got a lot of room in there in the dining area and stuff. You know, we could crowd in there and have the meeting there, and we would be at church. You know what I mean? But sometimes we get distracted by the trappings that go with it, and that becomes sort of the main thing to us rather than Jesus being the main thing. And you guys know that uh, as we're reading the Scriptures and we're going forward, we're moving forward, I'm going to be challenging us to rethink some of the things that we're holding on to that can become a distraction. Some of this is kind of the groundwork, but if you think about it, the parallels are pretty solid here, that the most important thing is that we're following Jesus. So the question is, what are you holding on to? What sort of religious trappings might you be holding on to? In what way am I like these followers of John the Baptist that have pretty much missed the main point of John's entire ministry? Am I thinking about the fact that Jesus is the main thing? Am I thinking about what we are called to do to be to go and preach the gospel and make disciples? That's what Jesus said we're to be about. But are we more concerned with polishing church furniture and maintaining our spot in the pew or, you know, whatever? I mean, there's any number of things that that could be. Is it the style of music that we're enamored with? Is it the, you know, the setting that we're doing things? Is there any number of things that could be, that may or may not be positive? 
That's all I'm asking for us to think about. Am I distracted by the trappings and missing the main point? Now, I'm not saying that we are necessarily. We have to have something to sit on when we're here, right? And you guys know I'm not making... This is a congregational rural church, so I've been talking to the church board, but I mentioned before, my preference is that we have... One of the ideas for us to consider is to use this room as a multi-purpose room. Okay? But I've been talking about this, and this is kind of one of the things. What are we holding on to? The pews that we have in here, for example, are, you know, they're hand-me-downs from another building. That's why they don't fit this building, right? Because another church gave it to us back in the 70s? In the 70s is what I've heard. That sounds about right. You know, so that's just in one example. Are we going to hold on to those things? One of the goals that I have is we have the mayor of Bliss. We're thinking about our community here. Chris, you all know him, grew up here. He had an accident when he was a teenager. He's in a wheelchair. One of my ideas is that anytime we do an all-church meeting and we open stuff up to the community and we do these dinners and stuff, sort of my litmus test is, can Chris come in and participate? Well, if we're doing that downstairs, not very easily. It puts him in an awkward place if we could pull it off at all. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's one of those things. What are we holding on to? What were John the Baptist, his followers, what were they holding on to? So there's some things that we got. We have to reevaluate as we go through our lives. And that's not the whole thing is not about this. I'm just using it as an example. And the, guy, the people in the church board are like, oh, here we go again. You know, Larry's on this thing right here. <laughs> Because I'm like, let's get rid of the pews, let's put some chairs in here that we can stack up and put some tables up here and use this as a multi-purpose room while we're waiting to do our addition and address that in, a, in another way. And uh, that's pretty straightforward But we, you know, for the Iwana kids and that type of thing. But that's my take on it. Okay, So it's, I just use that as an example. What are you holding on to? That's the question here. What are you being distracted by? John's disciples... It's interesting, they could not even rejoice in the greatest success in the ministry of John the Baptist. Which was that people were coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they were getting baptized. That was the greatest outcome that was possible of John the Baptist's ministry. And But look at them here. They're, they're obviously jealous of what was going on. They came to John, John the Baptist, and said to him, Rabbi, that man, they they haven't even learned to refer to him by his name. That man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, their own testimony should have them paying attention, right? Look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. Well, no duh, because that's what it's all about. You know, that's what it's all about. That's the main focus. Another thing that goes along with uh, what we want to be thinking about, and I, you know, sort of my job to shake things up around here, and I've said before, if y'all were busting at the seams and there was no room to park out here and stuff, I'd come in taking notes. And I'd take what I learned at Bliss onto my, you know, wherever I went from here and just count myself, you know, very blessed to learn from it. But. Things have sort of stalled out here a bit, especially when it comes to reaching the community. And when you're reaching the community, things get messy. Okay? They get messy. I remember Robin and I had a street a ministry to the kids. Uh, some of them were kind of street kids and stuff when we were in Felton, California. And one of the, you know there would be loud music in the cars in the parking lot and cigarette butts and all those sort of things that go along with it. Because when you do an effective ministry, there's some things get a little bit messy. And you've got to bring people along from where they're at. And we need to think about, we're not putting things up that are going to be barriers to people in that respect. And so there could be a time when it's change is sort of difficult for people like it was for the followers of John the Baptist. But you've got to think about when, when the Lord's going to bring something into your life, He's going to make things uncomfortable for you, right? If you didn't have things that were uncomfortable for you at times, then you're not growing. Because every, the status quo is good, I'm just good where I'm at, and you're not growing. All right, But you would assume that we're going to be constantly challenged as we're reading the scriptures and we're really seeing what it says. We're going to be challenged to change. The guys that we saw earlier in the Gospel of John, when John said, there is the Son of God, there's the Lamb of God, and they just followed Him. 
boom, they're off and running. Those guys really got it. Jesus is teaching them things that are amazing things, things that are different. They're seeing these miracles hanging out with Him. And they're preparing for the ministry, ministry that they have coming ahead. The guys here that are still with John the Baptist, they're stuck. They just got distracted by the, the trappings. You know, Eventually John's going to be arrested and in prison and he'll be executed. The whole point for them was to follow Jesus. Anyways, I throw that out as some ideas about some things that we can think about. It could be, you know, you're going to have people that come along, they don't know the Bible when they first get started as believers. So they're going to ask a lot of awkward questions. (laughs) That's to be expected. They're not going to have, there's a whole bunch of things that we just sort of take for granted in our lifestyles that, that... it takes people a while to grow in that process, and we've got to be patient with them and bring them along. You know, make sure that we're not presenting any barriers in front of them that will keep that from happening. All right, so let's make sure that we're keeping Jesus the main focus of our pursuits in our own personal lives and in our life in the church, that we're glorifying Him, that we're setting Him in the front foremost. He's above all. He's from heaven. He's above all. And to go along with that, He's going to be asking us to do some things that are out of our comfort zone sometimes. Also that goes along with that is a lot of excitement to see what He's going to do as we go out and trust Him in this process. In our own personal lives, we want to be thinking about, and I've I've been trying to encourage us to be praying about people that we can share the gospel with. People that God brings into our lives that we have an opportunity to point them, like John the Baptist did, point them to Jesus as the solution. Now remember this verse that says, in uh, 36, the one that I said would be a good memory verse. You kids can thank me when your parents tell you that's your next memory verse after family devotions. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Remember we saw last week that Jesus did not come to condemn, but to save. And a lot of people say, well, I don't have any, want to have anything to do with your God because He's the one, you know, He just wants to send people to hell. That's not the Gospel message. The Gospel message is they're already in that mess. <laughs> they're already condemned, right? That's the condition that they're in right now. The good news is that by faith in Jesus Christ, they can be removed from that condition. And that's the message that we have for people that we know around us. You know, we're not bringing in a message of condemnation. That's already true of people who don't know Christ as their Savior. We're bringing the good news to tell them that there's hope and that there's new life by putting faith in Jesus Christ. So, let's continue to pray for uh, people that don't know Jesus as their Savior and look for opportunities. And sometimes that's going to get a little uncomfortable for you because you're going to recognize when God does that. And they'll like, here they are. And people will just bring up spiritual matters. And they'll just straight up ask you some questions for the reason, for the hope that you have in you. Right? And you're going to be, you know, don't freak out. That's exactly what we've been praying for. That's exactly what we've been hoping for. And just keep it super simple, like the gospel message is. We're all in a mess. We're all lost in our sins. We're stand condemned already. And Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty for us. And as we put our faith in Him, He saves us. Last week we saw that He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that's true of everyone that we meet. So let's not get distracted and lose focus and get hung up on the peripherals, the things that are sort of like religious church trappings that can distract us and keep the main thing the main thing. Okay, we're going to sing our theme songs. Everyone would stand. We have a theme song for the Gospel of John. and worship your Son, Jesus Christ, who is Himself God. 
And we thank you so much that you've demonstrated your love for us and that while we were yet sinners, your son died for us. I just pray that uh, you would keep us from being uh, stuck in a comfort zone and distracted like the like these disciples of John the Baptist, that we would be like the disciples of John the Baptist who followed Jesus. We would be the ones who would step in behind and go where Jesus goes. And we'd be looking for uh, all those opportunities to spend time with Him, to get to know Him better, that uh, your heart would be our hearts, that our hearts would be transformed in line with who you are and the love that you demonstrate and And even as you said that you're not willing that any should perish, may that be our hearts as well. Give us opportunities to share the gospel message, your love with the people around us. And uh, help us to reevaluate the things in our lives that may be getting in the way of our own spiritual growth, may be getting in the way of the ministry that we're to have in making disciples. And we look forward to what you're going to do. And just pray that uh, we would be encouraged by your love. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.